just to stop and look around Taking every joyful sound All the things that really count Like this moment right now I'm gonna slow down Christmas this year Gonna hold on to everything dear to me Home by the Christmas tree Knowing how lucky we are to be here Gonna slow down Christmas this year Good morning. Join me in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. How many of you love to Christmas shop? Nobody. Right? It's like nobody has ever loved Christmas shopping, but it's something we got to do. Read a story about a, a dad who, uh, you know, went Christmas shopping yesterday afternoon, and he's, you know, looking around for that perfect gift. And by that time, you've either got to find the leftovers or the really expensive stuff. You know what I'm saying? And so he found this drone. The guy is, is, is showing him the drone. You know, he can go up, take the pictures, do all this stuff. And dad's sitting here just playing with the drone, fascinated by the drone. And he goes, you know what? I'll take it. And the, the little shop guy goes, oh, man, your son's going to love this. And the dad looks at him and says, you're right. I better take two. <laughs> you know, you ever do those things where you bought a gift and it's really for you, but it's, you know, you're going to give it to somebody else? Because really and honestly... It is hard to shop for people. Have you noticed that? I mean, nowadays, like my kids, they're both got jobs. They're both that. If they want something, they just buy it for themselves. You know, and so you get down to Christmas, and it's like, man, how am I going to shop for this person? So then you just decide, you know what? I'm giving it all up. I'm going to give them cold, hard hugs. <laughs> you know, in the morning, wake up, just give them a hug. That's all we really need anyway. Because honestly, the best gifts, the best gifts always are those things that are outside the box. You know, they have a deeper meaning, right? There's something that just really grabs your heart and grabs you and takes you back somewhere. So I've got an idea for next Christmas, guys. This year, we're slowing down Christmas. Next year, we're all going to gather here, and we're just going to act out. We're going to role play a Hallmark movie. <laughs> Anybody an executive from New York? Because we've got a lot of guys here with flannel, okay? We can, we can make this thing happen. But honestly... Sometimes I think we get so caught up in just all of that stuff, right? The glitz, the glamour, the lights. I've got to buy that perfect gift. That it all rings out a little hollow at the end. You ever have that moment where you've opened all your presents and you've done all your thing and you just sit down and you're like, wow, that was it? You know, Christmas is over now, right? I mean, it's just, man, the whole thing is just went run through. And I think we miss the deeper meaning of the thing. Because Christmas is more than a holiday. It's something so much greater. And if we miss the reason for it, we're going to miss the power of what we're supposed to be celebrating. That's why this year we've been slowing down Christmas, right? Had that moment where we're looking at the text of this great story of God becoming a man. And finding out that there's some deep truth here that we've got to celebrate. Because at its core, Christmas is more than a holiday. It is a promise fulfilled. And it's not just a promise fulfilled. It is the sign of God's intent toward humanity. Jesus, God got outside the box for this one. He hit us right in the real meaning of what we needed. We needed redemption. We needed a savior. We needed somebody to fix us. And God did it. 2,000 years ago, in a little town called Bethlehem, God became a man. And the Savior of all eternity was born. And his coming to earth meant something. It still means something today. Something that we can miss if we just gloss over it. There is power in Christmas. There is power in looking to what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because like I said, guys, we can talk all about the salvation and the life, and the peace, and the strength, like we have all, you know, all this time. You notice over here at our Advent candle, the only one still there is the Christ candle, because it is Christ who brings all those things, and to experience his life, his salvation, his peace, and his strength, we must focus on Christ alone. 
That's where we get it. Get rid of all the glitz, get rid of all the glamour, and let's see what Christmas is. Because you guys realize, all throughout the scriptures, God has always, you know, he's used holidays and festivals and feasts and all that to just demonstrate and, and retell the story of who he is and what he's done, the great acts that he's done. Christmas doesn't have to be any different. We can still set aside a time to honor what he's done and look at the power of this thing. So this morning, we're going to take just a little while. You notice some things are different. I don't even have a table. So you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to be one of those guys. Pointing my Bible at you, you know? <laughs> but this morning, I want to talk about celebrating the real meaning of Christmas. Looking at that promise that has been fulfilled and what it means to us today. And then talk about some ways that we can actually bring that into our own celebrations later today or whatever. If you say, well, we did our Christmas already and we did it last night. Hey, do it again. Jesus coming to earth is a big deal. And if we're going to say that's the reason in the holiday, man, let's take a look at what God's doing. So this morning, you're not going to have slides. We're all just going to be, be slowed down this time, right? Old school kind of thing. I may spit on you. I don't know. Some of you on the front row are like, Joey, how is that any different than any other Sunday? <laughs> but today, we're going to look at three life-changing lessons of the Christmas promise. Three life-changing lessons that if we learn from this incarnation, that God became man... It is going to change your life. Why? Because that's what God does. Now, in our text this morning, this is where Gabriel has come to Mary. Mary is minding her own business, doing her own little thing that Mary does. And the angel Gabriel comes and interrupts her life. And here's, here's the story. Go to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start reading um, verse 28-ish. He says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. 26. Uh, in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. How many of you would love to have an angel come and tell you that? You ever have those people walk up to you and they kind of butter you up? They're like, Hey, beautiful, how are you doing today? And what's your first thought? What do you want? <laughs> yeah, what's happening? Mary's no different here. She understands something is big, and there's an angel here to present a message. This angel is going to outline the power of God and the promise of God that he fulfills this thing in this baby that she's going to have. So guys, we're going to see these life-changing promises here that we can all rest on even today and call our attention back here and just slow down your life. I know we've got trouble I know we've got trials. I know we've got heartache. I know we've got fears. I know we've got sins. I know we've got, we're messed up. But let's listen to Mary's encounter with Gabriel. And let's just hear these promises and reflect on how we take those into our life. Okay, promise number one, God doesn't leave us. God does not leave us. He does not abandon you. All right, you ever feel like God's forgotten you, by the way? Have you ever been in that place where life has gotten so hard, or you are so broken, or you are just lost again in your sinfulness, and you've, wrought, you've fallen back off that wagon, you've gotten back on that sin that you promised you'd never do again, you've hurt somebody again, somebody's hurt you again, the world's coming at you, the doctors are all calling you, going, hey, we need to talk. All these things are happening to you, and you don't know where to turn next. So you look up at heaven, and you're like, God, where are you at? What is going on here, God? Don't you remember me? I promise you in this text, look back again, verse 26, the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Notice that. God sent the angel to Galilee, a specific place, to a town called Nazareth, specific -er place, <laughs> to a virgin, a specific person, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. You see how specific we get here? We go from just God sending Gabriel now to Galilee, now into the city of Nazareth, to find this virgin who's, married, who's going to be married to this man who's of the house and line of David, and her name is Mary. God has not forgotten you. God knows where you are. God knows who you are. God knows whose you are. God knows where you're going. God knows where you've been. God knows. He's watching. Okay? And he doesn't have to check his list twice. 
I know we feel forgotten, guys. Sometimes God does seem distant. I promise you, when the angel looks at Mary and he says, you know, uh, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. If you understand her culture and you understand that this is a poor woman in a culture that despised poverty, but yet it was rampant. In a culture that, just did, that held women, children, and slaves to be non-persons. In a culture that was suffering abject hunger and famine. In a culture that was under the oppressive thumb of the Roman Empire. I guarantee you she did not feel very favored by God. I guarantee you she didn't. And that's why she's troubled what kind of greeting you're giving me, buddy. <laughs> we can feel that way. But you know what the thing about God's promises if they're not fulfilled, then they're just a lie, right? So we know that God is going to fulfill his promise. And we need to rest back on that, that God does fulfill the promise. Understand how he does this. The angel is here to tell Mary, let's go on a little bit further. It says, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus whoa you're going to conceive in your womb you're going to have a child i'm the, the angel saying god is seeing you god has not only seen you mary but he's seen the oppression of the people and god remembers the promise you know when the bible talks about god remembering something it doesn't it's not like god is up in heaven and he forgot and he's like oh snap i forgot to do that that's not how god does it when the bible teaches that god remembers something what it means there it is now time to answer if the time has come in his perfect timing to do something. That's what it means. It shows up on his schedule and he's like, now let's do this because now's the time. Notice something here and I want you to pay attention to this. God does not leave us. He takes the initiative. Mary's living her own life and here's God going, you know what? Let me send this angel now to Mary. God took the initiative. God did not wait for us to get better. God did not wait for us to try harder. God did not just say, hey, you guys start doing this. Dead. No, no, he took the initiative. He sent a savior into the world. He came. That's what he did. And guys, in your life right now, I promise you something. God is going to take initiative. God is going to move. We have to rest in that promise. He works perfectly. He works on time. Wow perfectly and on time <laughs> you know right before this happened for 400 years god didn't speak to people god gave no prophets god gave no prophecies there was no scripture written during this what we call the intertestamental period between the old and new testaments nothing happening the people had the written word and they were continuing on in that but god wasn't speaking but now the bible says in the fullness of time god visits again he took the initiative, and in a perfect moment, he stepped into time. How? By stepping into time. Isaiah said in Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. He, uh, the virgin, will conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, some things you got to have the OG for. You know what I'm saying? you got to have the original. You can't just get a knockoff. You know in the Hallmark movies, anybody else watch the Hallmark movies so you can spot the knockoff actors? You know what I'm saying? You're like, oh, that guy looks like Brad Pitt. Ha, knock off Brad Pitt. He's the Wish version. Because <laughs> you know, that's what they put into the Hallmark movies, right? Because I mean, they can't get those people. They can't afford it. They ain't got that kind of budget. For salvation, we didn't need a knockoff. <laughs> we couldn't have just a dude. We had to have God come in the flesh. We had to have salvation himself come and walk among us and that's exactly the initiative that god took and in the fullness of time in the perfect timing jesus came into the world guys do you realize that's what we're celebrating today <laughs> that god took the initiative and remembered a promise and did not abandon us <laughs> you know what ultimately ultimately it means that god loves you god loves you that's why he will not leave you Hail Mary, you're, you're highly favored. You found favor with God. You say, well, Joey, that's Mary that found favor with God. You know, what about me? Well, when the angel appears to the shepherds in the next chapter, it's going to say that God is showing peace and goodwill toward all men. Guys, he's showing his favor in us. He's showing his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, the Son of God stepped into our time to provide a salvation. So, well, Joey, what if 
I get that. God doesn't leave me, but what if it's my fault that I walked away? <laughs> Don't be silly. Of course it's your fault you walked away. <laughs> I mean, guys, we're sinners. We've covered that. <laughs> But the reality is that God doesn't leave you. He sent a savior to save us in our sin and bring us back into fellowship with him. That's what this whole thing's about. The shepherd came to seek and to save the lost. He, you will call his name Jesus. He will not leave you. He is God with you. And I know you might be in a spot right now, but your God has not left you. Secondly, I mean, this gets even better. He makes all things new. God not only doesn't leave us, but he makes all things new. This is powerful. Go with me to verse 32. Verse 32 says, he will be great. Jesus will be great. <laughs> Could you imagine that? The angel telling you your son is going to be great. I've always, I want to walk up to some pregnant lady, random pregnant lady in Walmart and go, your child is the chosen one. And walk away. Just see what happens. <laughs> some of you are going, don't do that, Joey. <laughs> I'll let you know. Anyways, but Jesus will be great. He'll be great. What's going to make him great? Let's keep reading. He'll be, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Wow, tying in some more Isaiah prophecy of the increase of his government and kingdom. There will be no end. He's coming to rewrite things. He's coming to establish a new covenant. That's what's great about this. You know, other prophets called us and said, do this. Other prophets said, God is going to judge if you don't. The message Jesus is bringing is God is with us. Guys, you realize we're broken people, right? And a lot of that really gets highlighted at Christmas time. I mean, the, one of the reasons it's so difficult to shop, have you ever pulled something off the shelf and you're thinking, man, I'm going to buy this for my kid, and then you think, they're going to burn the house down with this? This is going to be broken with it now? Guys, we, we as humans, we break everything we touch, even other people sometimes. We're why God can't have nice things on the world. We break stuff. We hurt we get hurt. We sin. We get sinned against. Even the things we really care about, we hurt. Not on purpose, but we do. Why? Because we're people. It's what happens. You know, years and years ago, we had a smoke detector in the house that started beeping. That ever happened to you guys? I mean, when there's no smoke, right? It just, it's like you hear beep, and you're like, oh, what was that? Dog starts going nuts. Our dog vibrates when that happens. He is terrified of everything. I mean, he's like Courage the Cowardly Dog. You remember that? Yeah, this biscuit, man, he is messed up. He's got two jobs. Two jobs my dog has. Side note, we'll get back to the point in a minute. He's got job number one, lay there and get petted. I could do that. That's not hard, you know. But he's not good at that either. And the second job he has as the family puppy dog is to lay down his life in defense of the family. My dog can't do either one of those things. <laughs> but the smoke detector, beep, and he starts vibrating. He's scared to death now. Everything's going bad. And so what you do, you're like, okay, that's going to need a new battery, but I don't have time for that right now. So you push the little reset button, and it'll buy you about 12 hours. You know what I'm saying? You push the reset button. 12 hours later, you're sitting down. All of a sudden, beep. You're like, ah, oh, dog goes nuts. You go push it again. Then you might be gone. This happens. You're gone for a while, and you're not there to turn the alarm off, and your dog gets PTSD. <laughs> You can keep going and hitting the button, but eventually, what do we have to do? Change the battery. That's eventually what's got to happen for this thing to work right. You guys realize, at Christmas, we always want to push the button in our lives. I'm going to make every day Christmas from now on. I'm going to love people like Christmas. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be better for this time. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do differently. I'm going to be a better human. Yay, me. And we have New Year's coming up, guys. We get to make that our resolution and lose weight. But how long does that last? We try to do better, but we can't. Beep. Comes right back. Jesus didn't come to push a button in our lives. He came to give a new battery. He came to save his people from our sins. He came to redeem us and put his law and his spirit in our hearts. He answered the deepest need we have. Redemption. 
restoring us to where we're supposed to be in him and reflecting his glory in us again. So when we think about Christmas, guys, it shouldn't be the lights and the food and the family that gets us all giddy. It ought to be what God did through Jesus. He is great. He is the son of the most high. He's come down to rewrite and of the increase of his kingdom, there's not going to be an end. He is here and he is writing in our lives. Guys, this is powerful. Do you know what this means? This means that sinfulness can be changed to godliness. This means weakness can be made strength. This means chaos can become peace. This means wishy-washiness, quote me, can become consistency. Because the power of God at work in us makes all things new. This miracle of God coming in the flesh... You know what, I was, I was praying the other day, and I had this realization. We as the body of Christ, that new covenant we've talked about in the last few weeks, so I'm not going to just dive back into it, but God puts his spirit into us. You know that? That means God lives in us. Do you realize God is inside of you if you're born again? God is inside of you in just as literal a way as he was in Mary, in Jesus? You say, well, she was pregnant. With, you've been filled with his spirit. The Spirit is as much God as the Son is. That's how God works in us. That's how he recreates us. He's not asking us to do better. He's asking us to surrender to him. And then he will be great. He will redeem. He will rewrite. He will restore. That is the work of God in us. The fulfillment of Jeremiah's covenant. That God puts a new spirit in us. And he takes our heart and he replaces it with something brand new. Something that is responsive to his word. Something that reads the word and actually wants to obey it. Something that has a hunger for him inside of us to make us and cause us to walk in his way. Jesus brought it. And in doing so, he makes all things new. And it's the token promise that one day he's going to make all things new. Guys, are you celebrating that today? Wow. So we, we're looking here and we see that God doesn't leave you. God makes all things new. And this is a big one. I love this one. Third, God is the God of the impossible. God's the God of the impossible. Look at verse 34. Okay, listen to this. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? All right, Mary understands biology. She took that class. She knows what's going on here. And I love this point, okay? Notice something here. She is not doubting God's power. She's doubting hers. Catch that. She's not going, I mean, if this was me, if I was Mary, I'm a teenage girl in the first century, and the angel comes to me and says, hey, you're going to have a baby, and he's going to be great, and all this stuff. I would go, cool, as soon as me and Joseph get together, we'll have that baby. No, this is going to be great. But she understood he meant now. She understood he was talking about something greater, Right? And she's looking at this going, yeah, boy, that sounds great, Gabe, but uh, I'm a virgin. I can't have a baby. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. So here's what the angel says. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Wow. <laughs> Holy, the Son of God. This is a miraculous event, miraculous event, that God became man, born of a virgin, walking among us, his power, not ours, his truth, not ours. Here's the thing. We've already covered the theology of this in the last few weeks, so I'm not going to dive back into it right now. But the reality is salvation has never been about you. It's never been about me. It's never been about what you can do. It's never been about what I can do. Because let's pretend for just a second. Pretend. Pretend. Right? Because I'm one of those people that will burn down the house and mess the dog up with a new toy. Okay? Pretend I could start today. Change the battery. And never, ever, ever, ever sin again. Pretend I could do that. And if I never sinned again and I live to the ripe old age of, I don't know, what's old? 70? I don't know. So we get there and... I haven't got to the joke yet. Okay. <laughs> Pretend I could live to the ripe old age of, well, let's just go up there, 110. Whoa. Yeah. 
I've heard people born in December live to be more, more people who live to be 100 are born in December. Everybody I say that to has the same effect that I did when I heard it. No. But I live to 110. Starting today at 46 years and like a week and a half, I never, ever, ever sin again. That means I would live longer not sinning than I have sinned. Does that make me good enough to go to heaven? No. You say, why not? Because it's not a balance game. I've already sinned. And a just and holy God must judge that sin. It is impossible for me to earn God's favor that way. It is not possible for me to go, hey, God, I've done a good job today. Boy, I, I, you owe me one now, God. That's not it. Salvation in and of ourselves cannot be done because something's got to be done about the sin we've already committed. But God did the impossible by coming and dwelling among us. Salvation's never been about what we can do. It's been about what he can do. So how do we tap into this, Joey? I mean, the God is the God of the impossible. He does the things nobody else can do. And I'm not saying that he's going to, yo, let me tell you about my Jesus. He'll make a way. Yeah, his making a way is not always going to be making my life easy. Okay, that's not what he's about. He's about making my life reflect his glory. That's what he's about. And what's going to happen here is he will always work his own power to bring that about. He's not going to leave it to me and say, okay, Joey, glorify me. I'll see you later and judge you on it. <laughs> He's like, surrender to me and let me do this through you. That's all Mary's doing here. She's saying, I can't do this. And the angel's like, I know you can't. That's why God will. Listen, guys, in the coming year, I mean, here we are, slow down Christmas. Next week, it's New Year's. Let's get this thing done, right? We're back on. But the reality is here. God is going to challenge us in the coming year. He is going to challenge you in your work. He's going to challenge you where you are. He's going to be calling you to do the impossible things. He always does. But he's not leaving it to you to do it. He will not leave you alone. He will rewrite you and make things new in you so that we can do the impossible through him. What do we got to do for that? Just be faithful. Look at Mary. She's faithful in this. Elizabeth, in the next part of this thing, we're not going to read, but in the next part, Elizabeth is even going to tell him, man, you believed. You were faithful. That's all Mary does. Look at the rest of this. Mary says, um, I tell you what, just let's, let's get this. It says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. What if we surrendered to God? What if we said, you know, Lord, you are the one of the impossible. You're going to do what you do through me. Be it unto me. As you say, that's a hard prayer to pray. But what if we did? What if we were faithful? What if we admitted our inadequacy to do what God wants us to do? What if we admitted our helplessness in the situation we find ourselves in? What if we said, you know what, God, I will be faithful to you anyway. And then we came with a humility before him saying, God, help. I promise you something would change. You know, I love how the angel actually gives Mary a, a, a nugget here. Says, you know what, your relative Elizabeth over here. She's old. She's like 70. And she, and she is with child. She was called barren. It's not like she just had all these other kids and has another one at 70 or whatever. We don't know. But anyways, what the idea is here is she was barren. She had no children. She couldn't bear children. And here she is past the age of childbearing. And God goes, nothing's impossible for me. He, she, God gave Mary a, something to grab onto and say, that's how I can believe. That's what God always does. You say, well, what, what's my enough then, Joey? How am I going to know enough? Your enough is right here. God's given the word. And it is a solid word of prophecy. It is a sure word of prophecy. It is a tested word of prophecy. And we read this book and we see the great things God's doing. We look at each other and we see how God is moving and working in each other's lives. What more do we need? Well, you don't know what I've been through. No, I might not. But I know several others who are going through the same thing you've been through. And God healed and brought them through it. Joey, I'm weak. You know what? I know weak people. I see a weak dude every morning when I wake up and look in the mirror. 
I don't know how he gets in there, but he's there every morning and he's watching me. But I'm aware of that weakness. So that's not a good excuse either because God is strong. He's great so that we don't have to be. So what about my sinfulness, Joey? I promise you every other person on this planet is at least as sinful as you. And yet God forgives, yet he restores because he is the God of the impossible. So here we've got a God that we're celebrating today who walked among us to show that he does not abandon you. He's not going to leave you. He shows that he makes all things new. And he shows that he is the God of the impossible. The birth of Jesus is meant to be a game changer, guys. It's set in motion God's eternal plan for the ages. It's set in physical motion the fulfillment of the new covenant. And God became a man and walked among us. Never get over that. And when we grasp that, Christmas takes on a whole new meaning. It does. So how do we tap into that? I mean, what do we need to do? How can we celebrate that? I told you when we started out, we're going we're gonna to talk about some way to celebrate this together as a family. So I want to end with that. So just, just do some of these things. Number one, recall it. What do I mean by that? Read the story together. Talk about the story together, right? Talk about it. Talk, here's a fun question for the kids. You know, Morgan was asking those questions for the kids. Fun question. Dangerous question. But what, when is a question asked to a kid not a dangerous one? But ask them, what if God called our family to do something really big like this? Hmm, maybe we should talk about that sometime. So recall the story as you celebrate today. Talk about, your, talk about those slowdown moments. You know, as a staff, when we were getting ready to do this, this series, we all read the Christmas stories and we all came together and we talked about those things we'd never seen in the text before. You know, and just talking about how God showed this and, and hearing from each other and those things. Guys, that's a powerful time. Recall the story together. Retell the story. Talk to, it about, uh, yeah, talk to other people about the story of Christmas. Tell others what it means. When somebody looks at you and they say, Merry Christmas, look at them and say, A Savior is born. Why do we get to Easter and we're like, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We should be at Christmas time going, A Savior is born. And... I don't know. Yeah, he was. I don't know what the other side of that would be. But the idea is let people know what Jesus has done. And lastly, relive it. You know, that's why we have celebrations. That's why God gave feasts. That's why we have holidays. We get to sit around together and relive the significance of that event. Relive it. Talk about the greatness of our God who hasn't abandoned us. Talk about the greatness of our God who makes all things new. You want encouragement for the new year? There it is. And let God do what God does. Approach it with the same faithfulness, the same inadequacy, the same humility, and the same willingness as Mary. Quote from Calvin Coolidge. Christmas is not a time nor a season, but a state of mind. To cherish peace and goodwill, to be plenteous in mercy is to have the real spirit of Christmas. All right. But I think it goes deeper. To have the spirit of Christmas is to have the spirit of Christ in you. That's the spirit of Christmas. So guys, I just want to ask you that. Jesus came and walked among us. Is he living in you right now? That's the question. Have you come to him for forgiveness and salvation? Have you approached him, this great savior, and said, God, rewrite me? Have you done that? Because if you have not, you still stand under his wrath. You still are headed to a devil's hell for eternity. How do you get out? God hasn't left you. He's making all things new. He does the impossible by redeeming us by his own work accomplished on a cross 2,000 years ago. As the one and only eternal son of God bore the wrath of God that you and I deserve so that we could be gifted the righteousness of God as a free gift of his. And if you will come to him and believe that alone for your salvation, not your own works, not how good a person you are, not how well you dress, not how good a dressing or stuffing you make at Christmas, but you come to him and say, God, what Jesus did on the cross is all I need. How do I know it's all I need? Because three days later, he rose from the dead, overruling the penalty of death for us. 
if you want to look at it this way, his death on the cross is the payment for our sin. His resurrection is the receipt, paid in full. And that's why the scripture says we believe that. And we call that ours. Then God takes what Jesus did and applies it to us and saves us, rewrites us, and makes us the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Guys, that's the Christmas promise, all fulfilled in what Jesus has done. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given to us today. And Father, as we come to you, I ask you, Jesus, to look upon us today. And Father, if, we, if there's somebody in this place that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, then Jesus, grab them today. By your Spirit, convict their hearts by your spirit, show us our sinfulness and draw us into the presence of our great God for salvation. But Father, there are many here today that are saved. We know that, God. And, but sometimes we do feel abandoned. Jesus, today let us lay down that burden before you because you never abandon us. The birth of Christ is proof positive of that. Jesus, you work in our hearts in forgiveness and so often we fall back into the same old sins that beset us. Father, I pray that today you remove those sins from us. Remind us that we are forgiven and we are free. Let us walk in the freedom that you make all things new. Lord, make us new today. And by your spirit, through your blood, remove that from us. Remove that guilt. Remove that shame. Take away that pain. And Father, for the things you're calling us to do. The hard things, share our faith. The hard things, be more committed to you. The hardest things, forgive others. Love as you love. Let us know that in us, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Father, shower us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your spirit. So that we may walk in the impossible. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.